Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tax Power Hour. Today's episode is expenses versus capital expenditures, depreciation, and cost segregation studies. Fun. <laughs> Today is May 3rd, 12 p.m. Eastern, and this is the monthly May 2017 webinar. Today's content, we'll spend about five minutes just talking about what Tax Power Hour is, then we'll spend about 10 minutes kind of differentiating between what's a deductible expense and what's a capital expenditure or, or a fixed asset. Then we'll discuss depreciation methods, mostly tax-based depreciation methods. And then Heather, our um, guest speaker, which I'll speak about her in a, in a minute, will talk about a cost segregation study, which is a very uh, sort of uh, deep end uh, tax planning tool that is used by tax professionals to help uh, people when they're acquiring uh, large assets to try to figure out, you know, what's the best or most optimal way to take a depreciation expense on those uh, assets that are within that big purchase or maybe for a construction. We'll, we'll discuss all those details. And then the last five minutes, that will be about 20 minutes, and the last five minutes will be open to Q&A. So this will take approximately about an hour. So what is Tax Power Hour? We are a small business and self-employed ta tax tips and tricks. We meet in a monthly basis on this uh, webinar. If you're watching it live, then you don't need the link. But if you're going to be watching this in YouTube later on, you can use the link that's on the screen. And we also put it on the description normally, so you can subscribe and watch it live. Our website is taxpowerhour.com. It's still on the construction, putting together some content. It's going to have a lot of tax content in there. And then the Facebook group, just search for Tax Power Hour. Join the group great place to have conversations about uh, taxes for small business. Now, this webinar series is every month, the first Wednesday of the month. Uh, usually it's between 30 to an hour long. It's not set in stone how long it's going to be, but it will be about an hour. You register once you and you will have access to all the episodes. You will get an invitation basically an hour, a couple hours before the episode. Uh, some of the episodes may have sponsors or we may have some collaborated content with uh, third-party vendors that will help fund the webinar. For, for the time being, it's, there isn't any, so it's just uh, me who's running the whole thing. Um, but you may see that later on in the future. And we do not currently do CPE or IRS continuing education uh, credits for the time being. If I get enough requests on that, we'll see if that will make sense. And the topics are generally discussions about tax law, some practical examples, on taxes, maybe tax software, that's still gonna be fair game. Maybe we can discuss some tax software. Uh, anything having to do with payroll tax, sales tax, uh, taxation or legal entities, and any other tax topics are open topics that we will uh, start bringing into the table on this monthly webinar. About the host, about myself, my name is Hector Garcia. I am a CPA based out of Miami, Florida. I have my, uh, my firm, together with a couple of other accountants and we do accounting technology and tax planning services which includes tax preparation and i'm an advanced quickbooks pro advisor there's my email hector at garcia cpa.com if you got any questions about tax accounting or quickbooks i'm usually pretty open to uh, answering emails uh, but today's guest uh, her name is heather uh, satterley she's an advanced quickbooks pro advisor she's a national trainer for intuit she trains other accounting professionals, mostly on the QuickBooks, getting on the cloud side. But she is an enrolled agent, and she's a she used to be a practicing accountant. Her, her website is qbotrainer.com, and her email is qbotrainer at gmail.com. She's also really good at answering her emails, and she'll be doing the presentation on cost segregation. Heather, you want to say hi and introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Thanks, Hector. First of all, thank you, Hector, for having me on the, the Power Hour. This is really exciting. Um, happy to be here. So yeah, um, I have about 20 years experience in tax. Uh, the last gig was six and a half years at a 10-person uh, CPA firm where we did a lot of cost segregation studies. Um, but now I have a new firm, Saturday Training Consulting, and my focus is on uh, coaching and helping other practitioners uh, with internal and client processes. And and really uh, getting a handle on accounting technology. So I don't do any tax work now um, for taxpayers, uh, but I, I 
I have a lot of experience in that. So again, thanks for having me, Hector. I'm excited to be here. And hi, oh. everybody. <laughs> you know, th thanks, thanks for uh, joining us, Heather. Okay, so quick disclaimer before we get started. Um, in no practitioner can give written or electronic advice based on unreasonable legal or unreasonable factual assumptions or representation. So the, these are hypothetical cases that we'll be talking about, and we cannot give advice if we don't have a reasonable case to actually give proper advice. So a webinar in which we talk about tax and both uh, Heather, who's an enroll agent, and myself, who is an ex-enroll agent and now a CPA, um, have to be very careful about what constitutes advice. Now, we also cannot give advice that uh, that is on the premise of possibility possibility of audit or whether an issue or not could be auditable. So if there's any questions, and we do take questions from the group, uh, we have to be very careful about how we word some of these things. And we always, um, oh, I mean, we never will be giving legal advice. So there may be some things that we're discussing in the, in the, in the realm of taxes, which looks and sounds like legal advice, but I'm making the proper disclaimer up front. None of this is meant to be legal advice. For any legal advice, you must contact uh, an attorney. Okay, so that's really, really important. And the most important thing is if, if you're a small business owner or, or a taxpayer um, and you're doing your own taxes or whatever, and you, and you see some ideas coming up in these webinars, you know, I, I, we, we certainly want you to uh, research them and, and, and take advantage of them. But I'm always going to recommend that you consult a tax professional. If you go to the IRS website, just Google Directory of Federal Tax Return Preparers with Credentials, and anyone that's that's enrolled with the IRS, either an enrolled agent like Heather or a CPA like myself, would be listed there. So I would strongly recommend that you only work with a tax professional that's that's listed on the IRS website as a as a practicing tax professional. Um, because they obviously have something to lose if they screw up. Now, we have some upcoming episodes in the future. Um, we'll discuss that towards the end of the webinar, but uh, we already have them planned out the next three episodes coming forward. All right, so let's start with the topics. Um, capital expenditures versus expenses. So general rule, let's talk about deductible expen expenses. So when a, when a business, a small business, self-employed individual makes an expenditure, uh, typically, what what in their mind goes through is, hey, I'm making an expenditure. I'm going to get a tax deduction. It's going to be a deductible expense. Well, the general rule is, as long as the expense itself is ordinary and necessary, um, it, which, which means it's, it's, it's a common practice, it's accepted by the industry, it's normal, and necessary means that it's required for you to make that expenditure in order for the business to function, that is going to be a deductible expense. However, there are certain expenditures that um, where, where its value lasts more than the tax period, you know, so when you buy a car, when you buy a building, when you buy a computer, these things are actually not considered to be quote unquote expenses. They're, um, they're considered to be capital expenditures and these cannot be deducted 100% on the year that is purchased. And that's what we'll dig deep about, which is a concept of depreciation. So general rule on capital expenditure or capital expenses would be on your first year, you have startup and organizational costs. There are rules that limit how much of that you can deduct on the first year, and then the difference would have to be amortized over time. Anything that's considered, quote, unquote, a business asset, so a fixed asset that has long-term value, so any anything that's uh, that you purchase that will still be there the next year and has a significant value that has to be depreciated over time. Anything that's called an intangible asset, like the purchase of goodwill, the purchase of a brand, uh, uh, getting a, obtaining a patent. These things are uh, amortizable. They're not, uh, they're not uh, deductions, they're amortizable. That means they have to be, uh, be booked as an asset in the books. And then we have to take portions of that over time. Capital improvements like to real estate or to an office, right, that would be um, amortizable over time. That would be a capital expenditure. There's something called the uniform capital, ca capitalization rules which is really for sort of larger manufacturers that requires you to take not just the direct material expenses, but you actually have to capitalize some of the um, overhead expenses from like a factory and put it as part of your inventory cost. And that's sort of a form of capitalization. There's no depreciation, 
per se, but it is one of the one of the special rules there is on capital expenditures and something called capital leases. And this is actually a pretty interesting one. If you go and you lease, let's call it a machine, and at the end of the lease, you pay $1 and you keep it. That's called a $1 buyout lease. That is actually um, a, 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 a straightforward uh, purchase. So so even though it's, it's called a lease in the documentation, that has to be treated as a purchase. So you basically have to amortize it the same way you would as a, as a, a, a regular asset and take uh, interest, a, a computed interest expense on it because a capital lease that has a $1 buyout is the same thing as, a, as purchasing on credit. Now, if you do a regular lease in which the, the asset itself has a residual value, so it's typical with like vehicles, for example, you buy a car that's $30,000 when you turn it in is $15,000. So that $15,000 difference um, is gonna get uh, leased basically, quote unquote, through time, and you're actually paying rent, right? I mean, not rent, sorry, uh, sales tax, and you're paying uh, what's called uh, a, a money factor. When, when that's the case, then that's an actual regular lease, and that's a deduction. Um, so you have to be able to differentiate between a straightforward lease that does not have a $1 buyout because then the lease payment itself, the whole thing is a deduction. But if it's a $1 buyout, then you have to uh, capitalize it and depreciate. Now, what, how do you define where the capital expenditure is? So let's call it in layman terms, a larger upfront value. So it's, it's sort of larger value than your regular expenditures. Um, it's necessary to create infrastructure that produces income. So anything that's income producing, you can think about, well, this is likely to be a capital expenditure. Typical examples, as we said, buildings, furniture, vehicles, capital improvements. Now, the value of this um, purchase is consumed over time as the asset loses value. This is what we call the technical term is depreciation. Now, there are some cases in which when you buy land, for example, land technically doesn't depreciate. So that doesn't lose value over time. And most real estate, you know, depending on when you bought it, right? But most real estate does not lose value over time. So the rule of thumb is not that it always loses value over time. It's just that the cost is consumed over time, therefore is deducted over time. And that's what depreciation is. Now, there's something called the value threshold. And this is like a really, really important topic. Very common question I get from my clients as a tax preparer is how much of how much the purchase needs to be in order for it to be a, a fixed asset or a, um, a a depreciable expense and i'm going to tell you the answer is there's no set number there's no number that the irs or anyone says that this dollar amount is the minimum or the maximum that something could be an asset or a depreciable expense now there are rule of thumbs like most companies, for some reason, and I've, I've, I've looked at thousands of tax returns, for some reason, they use the $500 rule of thumb. And I read there was a, you know, there was some guidance from the IRS that they published in which they put that $500 number in there and they made it, quote unquote, safe harbor. And that kind of became universal. So most small businesses use the $2,500, I mean, sorry, the $500 rule of thumb. However, the IRS published a new guidance in 2015 in which they increase, quote unquote, again, I said there's no set number in stone, but they increase the safe harbor, harbor rule of thumb to 2,500. What does this mean? This means that you can safely, as a small business, you can safely purchase a $2,000 computer and 100% expense it that year instead of having to depreciate it and capitalize it over time. And before that number, the, the general number people used was 500. So that's kind of the concept now. But the value threshold is is technically, typically an internal number that is managed by the company and it's part of company policy, especially because many companies calculate depreciation, what they call book depreciation, which is the accounting depreciation um, that uses accounting methods. And, uh, and many companies just skip all that and you go straight to the tax method and don't keep track of two different depreciation methods. So if you are gonna use a tax method, 
uh, use uh, either the five hundred or twenty five hundred dollar number, and that's how you'll know. So if you have an asset worth more than whatever that number is, twenty five hundred, automatically should be an asset and should be depreciated over time. Or if you make that number five hundred, whatever you want to do, uh, but that needs to be an internal company policy. I, I'm normally now using twenty five hundred as my as my number for some of the larger small small businesses, uh, but for some of the little tiny ones, you know, that have couple hundred thousand dollars of sales a year i typically use a 500 hundred dollar rule okay now what is depreciation a depreciation is basically a reduction of value of the asset over time and that reduction of value it's it's the expense not the purchase just that one reduction of value depreciation uh, follows what's called a matching principle there's an underlying accounting principle we're talking about from the accounting level not necessarily tax level there's an accounting concept that says we need to match expenses with the sales. So I, I earlier defined a fixed asset or a capital expenditure as infrastructure needed to produce income. So if you buy a building, which is going to last you probably forever, um, and that's going to produce you income, it is completely unfair that we take the entire building purchase and depreciated or deducted the first year, we need to sort of try to match that with your revenue. Now, although we can't match uh, depreciation with revenues because the rules are based on a particular recovery period, which we'll discuss later, it does still, in my opinion, depreciation follows that matching principle. Now, accumulated depreciation is the amount of depreciation that you have year over year. And this is the one that reduces the value of your asset. So in your balance sheet, your asset is going to be worth your original purchase minus that accumulated depreciation. And that net of the two is what we call book value. So these terms are really important um, because you know, if, if you are, let's say, for example, you're a non-tax uh, practitioner and you're talking to a tax practitioner, it would be very nice that you're talking on the actual technical terms. Or maybe you're a small business owner talking to an accountant. It would also be kind of nice if your accountant doesn't bring the concepts down to layman, that you at least understand the concept. So um, that contra asset concept, basically it's a reduction or a negative uh, asset value. Now in your balance sheet, you're going to have the quote unquote, the book value of your assets. And that's, that's, that's a um, accounting a calculated number. It may not necessarily be the market price. And that's an, a huge area of confusion because I have a lot of clients in which I give them a balance sheet that has all the depreciation and they're looking at it. They're saying, look, my building is worth a lot more than that. Why are you saying that it's worth only 200,000? And, and I have to explain, well, you purchased it for 300 and we've been depreciating 100,000 over the years and we've been taking that tax benefit. So your book value is 200, but they say, but that's not the value of my property. I want my balance sheet to show the value of my property. And that's the key in accounting. We don't do what's called mark-to-market of fixed asset. We use the original purchase price minus accumulated depreciation, and then we depreciate it. And in tax, uh, in many cases, you depreciate it to 100%. So your assets are worth basically nothing. But in the real world, they're worth something. And people get a little bit confused because the balance sheet shows their company is not worth anything. But that's what they did. They, they, they took advantage of uh, accelerated depreciation methods and they lower the value of uh, the asset over time. Um, Heather, do you have any experience with people sort of getting confused and uh, and not understanding that book value? I would say from a taxpayer perspective, that book value number. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, for a lot of small business owners, they do get confused because they they think of their value, they think of the value of their property in terms of market value as opposed to cost. And, um, and and the depreciation concept to them is is pretty foreign as well. So definitely I've had that conversation many times with clients where they need to understand that the market value is very different from what the cost um, basis is in their their property. Exactly. but but there is a, there is a situation in which market value is used and that's yeah. what you're going to be talking about the cost segregation study. Mm -hmm. So, so you're going to be talking about that other side of the coin uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank, right. thank you, Heather. So uh, the, the other concept is depreciable ba basis. So the depreciable basis is the portion that we're going to depreciate. So in, uh, in accounting uh, financial terms, we always have to have a salvage value, which is how much the property will be worth 
when I'm done depreciating it through my through the years, right? That that is uh, that 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 is being consumed or depreciated over time. However, in tax, which is kind of interesting, in tax there's no salvage value, so we always depreciate down to 100% in tax, which is different than in financial. Now, the non-depreciable basis is the portion that we don't depreciate. Typical case is land. Land is never depreciated, not in the financial side and not in the tax side. And also, if you got a property that's what's what we call listed property, which is a property that has multiple personal and business use, the portion that is used personally that would be non-depreciable, and that's what they call the non-depreciable basis. Now, the useful life of the asset, and the technical term is a recovery period, it's in how many years uh, we need to depre- depreciate that asset. And there's, there's special asset classes. You can't just choose that number. You have to put it into one of the buckets. Now, the date that uh, that is placed in service is extremely important because um, you can you can buy an asset let's say at the beginning of the year, but maybe it's not fully placed in service until July, technically you can't start depreciating it until July because that the date that you place it in service, it's when it starts getting depreciated. And as I mentioned, the salvage value is how much it's worth after we're done depreciating it. So quick calculation um, on, on, on a financial schedule, it's we take the, the purchase price of the, v, of the, of the asset, we remove the non-depreciable portion, like like a land. We uh, we reduce the salvage value. How much will be worth when we're done depreciating it? And at the end, that's called a depreciable basis. And in a straight line, it's pretty straightforward. You figure out how long the asset will last you for, and you divide that by the number of years or the number of months, and then you get the amount that gets depreciated. Now, there are other depreciation methods, and we're still talking about accounting, not tax. So like uh, output method, which is means that if you have a boat engine that, that is supposed to last 10,000 hours, you depreciate it based on the hours usage or something like that. Uh, double declining balance, that's an interesting one. We basically uh, take the remainder of the, of, of the time and we multiply, we, we double the, the, what would be a straight line depreciation. So for example, uh, on a double declining uh, balance of, of a five years, on a straight on a straight line, you would take 20%, but on a uh, on a double, you would take 40% the first year. But then you start um, you know reducing because only the difference, uh, whatever's left, gets depreciated by that amount moving forward. So it's basically a, a accelerated method that, that that lets you take more at the beginning and less towards the end. Um, you know, it's like they say, you know, you, at the minute you take out a vehicle out of the car dealer, it's already lost its value by. 10%, 50%, 20%, whatever that number that people uh, say, you know, that that uh, that saying. And normally the next year doesn't lose another 15 or 20%. So you get that that immediate real high depreciation at the beginning, and then it starts losing over time. That's what that is. And there's some of the digits I won't get into that. That's another method is important that you know. But um, it's important to understand what double declining balance means because in taxes, uh, we, we use what's called the modified accelerated depreciation method, uh, which is called makers. And that uses the double declining balance concept. So basically the, wor- the, the way it works is in a typical five-year scenario that you take 20% every year, notice that the first year you take double, 40%. And then whatever the remaining value uh, on, on the asset is, you, 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 you keep doing that over time and, and notice how you get a, a much bigger depreciation up front. And that's an important sort of general concept to know because in taxes, it actually uses this one. Now, why depreciation? Why, why does this even exist? We, we talked about from the uh, accounting side, uh, we depreciate because we want to do a matching principle. We want accrual books and we want, the time, we want to uh, follow the time period assumption of, uh, of accounting principles, which means, you know, that we are uh, fairly capturing the expenditure of that time period, that consistent time period, and buying a, a, a vehicle uh, one year and depreciating 100% one year or taking a deduction just doesn't follow that principle. Now, why does the IRS want depreciation? That's a very interesting one, too. 
this one is because of the conservatism principle. Like uh, the IRS, the IRS wants, I mean, technically because they want you to pay more tax, the IRS wants you to take less deductions so you show more taxable profit, which in the accounting world is a little bit different. In the accounting world, you want to take what, what people want, what people want to show income, right? People want to show income. But in the IRS, people usually want to reduce taxable income, but the IRS is going to now, you know, uh, hold on to the conservatism principle from accounting principles and say, hey, we need to be conservative about our net income. Therefore, we should not take uh, a huge hit the first year and we need to depreciate over time. But with that said, why would the IRS um, have accelerated depreciation methods? So there's one called Section 179, which basically allows you to depreciate 100% of the purchase up front, and there are some limitations. And the reason for that is because the IRS wants to give a little bit of that cash basis feel to some of the smaller businesses that, that probably can't afford to fund their operations long term, and they're making this huge expenditure up front, and they want to help them take a tax deduction. So that's why the IRS has this quote-unquote cash basis depreciation method, which is uh, Section 179. And also, uh, they want to, because of tax policy, they want to encourage capital expenditures. I will tell you from my own personal experience, a business that um, that spends uh, a lot in their capital structure tends to be more successful. Now, not always the case, but in most cases, people that have updated equipment, high-tech equipment, bigger buildings, more production capacity tend to be more successful over time. So our all-wise government, through their tax policy, they want to encourage major capital expenditures and give that accelerated depreciation. That's, so that's why, and, like, and this, is more, this is actually most of my opinion, this is not like written anywhere, but this is why I think depreciation even exists uh, for the tax world. Now, another important consideration and when Heather jumps in and talks about um, cost segregation study, all these things play into come into play. You know what what is going to be a Section 179 deduction? What's going to be a five year? What's going to be a seven year? Um, and also the convention. The convention is really important. Now, typically, the IRS, uh, regardless of when you buy the asset, lets you depreciate it starting the middle of the year. That's what they call the half year. So if you bought something January 1st or you bought something December 31st, you, you only get you get half the year's deduction. So if for, for some people buying towards the end of the year, this is a benefit. For the people buying towards the beginning of the year, not such a huge benefit the first year because you only get half. So that's how the IRS compensates. They, they let you take an accelerated double declining balance approach, but you can only start depreciating in July 1st, right, half year. Now, for real estate specifically, depreciation starts on the middle of the month that it was acquired. So for real estate, the half year rule doesn't matter. And then there's one overarching rule that says, if you actually purchase more than 40% of your assets um, during the last quarter of the year, then you take a mid-quarter, which means you only really get 45 days of depreciation uh, for the, your entire asset class that year. So it is not wise to purchase more than 40% of your assets all in December because you will uh, not be able to take such a huge depreciation uh, that year. So that, 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 that concept that people say, oh, buy a whole bunch of assets in December, you have to be careful because if it's more than 40%, you don't get... Uh, you don't get the, the, the half year uh, convention. You don't get more than months. You only get 40, uh, 45 days. But for, sorry, uh, 45 days, yeah. But for section 179, this doesn't matter. We'll discuss that a little bit later on. Um, well, actually, we'll discuss it now. <laughs> so section 179 allows you to fully depreciate 100% of your assets. Some of the assets are not, uh, they're not allowed. So we'll discuss that um, in a second but it allows you to take 100% depreciation, but it is limited to your taxable income. So if you have profits, you can take section 179 and you can bring your profits all the way down to zero if that depreciation is more than your profits, but you're not allowed to go into negative. Whereas a regular depreciation can, uh, can 
make you go in negative and can de- can make that negative go even deeper. Um, there's a maximum of a half million dollars that you can deduct on Section 179, and you cannot Section 179 listed property. So a vehicle is listed property, and a mixed use personal and business would also be a um, a listed property. Now, in certain years, you will see this thing called a bonus depreciation, where it allows you to take half of the value and 100% uh, the value, 30% of the value, and take a deeper depreciation than normal. And this one does allow you to deepen that taxable loss if that takes you into a negative. Um, but the bonus depreciation in 2017 is not really a thing. It's something that in the last couple of years was was very used, but this year not so much. But don't I mean. Don't disregard it because it may come back. Um, now, yes, uh, Heather, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to interject, Hector, that one, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that the state tax laws differ. A, you know, a lot of states differ from the IRS tax law. So I know in, in the state of Rhode Island, we don't allow bonus depreciation. So when we're doing the calculation on assets in Rhode Island or depreciation in Rhode Island, um, our a lot of times our tax depreciation for the federal government is different from what we have on the state return, so we have to do adjustments. Right. So you're going to interject that. So yeah, that, that's a good point. So so you basically have to keep track of multiple depreciation methods. Exactly. One, one for your corporate return, uh, for your IRS return, and one for your state return. In some exactly. other cases. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and in the case of S corps and and uh, and partnerships, if you have uh, because you got passed through. There may be some states that don't allow Section 179, so right. uh, so those may not pass through. That's that's a good point. Uh, and the but, limits can be different too. And the so, limits can be different. So yeah. half a million dollars is an IRS limit, not necessarily a state limit. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And if you actually Google uh, Makers M A C R S, I don't know why I put up there. Uh, it's M A C R S. Uh, you can actually see uh, the different tables, so you can understand you know how much depreciation you take on the year so if you as you as you can tell a typical five-year profit i mean property takes 20 percent of the asset value the first year 32 uh the second year and 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 this is a question i get why is the second year more than the first remember that the first year is half year only so um so in the case of a five-year property you normally would take 40 percent the first year but because it's only half year, it's only 20%. So that's, that'll be good to look at those tables for that. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Heather I won't be, because I, I want her to be able to present her stuff. But let me go through these real quick. Typical five-year depreciable property, automobiles, computers, office equipment, appliances for residential real estate. Typical seven-year depreciable property, office furniture and fixtures, agricultural equipment. Typical... Uh, 15 year is property improvements. Uh, property improvements are very typical 15 year and residential real estate gets 27.5% and non-residential real estate, get, sorry, 27.5 years and non-residential real estate gets 40 years. And this is extremely important. This is why cost segregation studies are so important because different asset classes within one major purchase uh, uh, could be identified and you can take a deeper depreciation on the first year if you can identify more five-year property than 10-year property or 15-year property. That's what Heather will be talking about. And lastly, we got amortization. So normally, business startup costs can need to be amortized for five years. You can take $5,000 of deduction the first year of a startup and $5,000 of an organizational cost, and the difference gets amortized over five years. And any intangible assets like goodwill patents, they amortized over 15 years, which by the way, in accounting rules, in financial accounting rules, typically we don't depreciate or or, uh, or amortize intangibles. They, they stay fixed forever in your balance sheet, where in taxes, you're allowed to take a deduction. And there's some special cases in which you 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 uh, amortize an expenditure, a capital expenditure, and you will match it to the underlying to another an underlying asset. So, for example, I'm going to amortize, let's say, some points that I paid on a mortgage for a building. Well, the way I amortize it, I do it through the life of the loan, right, or something like that. Depend, or uh, uh, there's some some other uh, intangible that I bought together with a tangible asset, and that tangible asset lasts 
five years, I could I could match it with the with the tangible asset itself. So those are some special cases, and you know we have to look at case by case to see which ones uh, matter. Now for advanced tax planning, usually tax preparers uh, will calculate once the when is the optimal time to purchase an asset. So if you buy an asset in January first, understand that maybe you don't get the deduction for the entire year. So you could wait or hold off to July 1st anyway, because you're only gonna get half a year, or in many cases you can wait till December 31st to buy it and and, and get that same uh, deduction. So um, so when you purchase an asset, you wanna consider, well, what, what are my financing costs? Uh, the time value of money, like if you have to pay a big down payment or pay, or pay a tax or, or, or pay it upfront, uh, what is the productive capacity, how much, that asset will produce for you, and at the end, the tax savings. So advanced tax planning with, with the purchase of assets, you consider not just how much you can depreciate, but you consider all those moving parts to consider when or what asset will be the most efficient. And that type of consulting work, it's actually very profitable work because clients get a huge tax deduction and they typically pay really well for services that give a big tax deduction. The other major service you can do is called a cost segregation study and i'm going to pass it over to heather i'm going to give her control and she's going to talk about what a cost segregation study is for the time being while i switch i'll just do a quick uh polling question just while while we do a switch of uh, presenter and heather i'm switching over presenter to you okay okay and go ahead and share your screen please all right, I gotta wait to share my screen once the poll is closed. So okay. I'll do yeah. that as soon. Do you want to start introducing the concept while we finish the poll? Sure, absolutely. So um, a cost segregation study um, is is where you're taking. It's it's most commonly used in construction and other as um, acquisition uh, transactions. And what you're doing is you're analyzing the costs of the construction or the acquisition, and then you're classifying those costs into property classes in order to accelerate the tax depreciation deduction. So for example, if you are buying an apartment building and that apartment building came with some furnishings, um, when you buy the building, it, it has, you know, there's a lot of different components to it. If you were to take the whole purchase price um, and, you know, classify it as building, then you're gonna be stuck depreciating that property over you know 39 years um you know for the whole property whereas if you do an analysis and you look at um the different assets that are included as the contents of the apartment building plus the land then you can group things like um you can group things like uh you know um furnishings or appliances into a shorter class group and be more aggressive with the depreciation deduction. So that really helps um, in maximizing the depreciation deduction for, you know, for your clients. So, and for the taxpayer. Um, so am I able to share my screen yet? Oh, um, there we go, perfect. Yep. All right, let's see. Okay, can everybody see my screen? I can see it now, yep. Perfect. So, so that's what a cost segregation study is, is you're looking at all the costs of construction or any other kind of, of um, acquisition and you're breaking it down into property classes so that you can maximize the depreciation um, deduction um, for tax planning purposes. So benefits of a cost segregation services, um, well, you have the tax planning benefit that Hector talked about to taxpayers. Um, the first year depreciation deduction can be maximized. Um, or in some cases where, you know, you expect your um, your tax rate maybe, you know, to go down, then you would want to spread the depreciation out a little bit further. So what it does is it allows you to classify all of the expenses into different classes to, you know, to basically make sure that you're getting the right uh, time period that you're depreciating over the, the, the right time period. So um, cost segregation studies, they're an addition, additional service offering, which brings added value to the taxpayers because it's a very integral part of that tax planning process. So 
Um, if I buy a building and I'm working with it, you know, if I do my own taxes, I may not know about the different classifications and the fact that I could actually reduce my tax liability um, by doing a cost segregation study. So that's where the value of working with a tax preparer that does understand these concepts really becomes important to me. Um, it's also uh, cost segregation services are a real potential for niching for tax preparers. And I know we have a lot of accounting and tax professionals on the call today, and this is a great place for you to niche. Um, if you become a specialist in cost segregation services, you know, this can lead to referrals from other professionals, your clients, and you're also going to be able to charge higher fees. So a typical cost segregation study, at least at the firm where I was working at before, somewhere around, you know, $5,000 to $20,000, depending on the project. Um, and I'll tell you that cost segregation studies, big ones, they're not easy jobs. I mean, you, the, the process, and we're going to talk about the process um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, it's a big engagement. It's an engagement that I would, I would, you know, Hector and I were just talking about this before we came on the call. That that we would we would compare to an audit. That you need to have planning, um, and it needs to be executed in a way that um, you know that provides the most benefit for the client, and also uh, is you know is efficient for. The person actually performing the service. Well, it is it is an, an audit of the fixed assets, correct? It and, is. And, yeah. and, and in some cases, you are researching the market value of those assets to see, you know, whether it is a fair assessment, and you have to document, you know, how you figured out uh, how you figured out the value of those assets that were not uh, previously separated, correct? I mean, so it's an audit plus <laughs> in some cases. It is not a plus. I mean, first you have to substantiate all the costs, right? And then you're right. Then you have to go through and you have to apply your knowledge of, you know, the asset classes and the different um, ways that you can depreciate those assets um, in order to figure out what the deduction is. So can definitely. I give, can I give a quick example of something of that, course. I, that I've seen? Yeah. So, um, and, and this, this chart here explains it very well. So in, in mm -hmm. Miami, sure. where I practice, there's a, a lot of real estate purchases. And I personally don't do cost segregation studies. I mean, I refer them to a firm of a couple of colleagues that do that. And you have you have basically an investor group that wants to buy, let's say, a $10 million building. And uh, and that investor group, uh, as part of their multiple investments, they have you know some profits from other categories. And they're saying, here, yeah, we want to purchase a, a building that's going to be heavily tax efficient. We want to take uh, a, a, a big depreciation of that purchase, right? Um, so normally when you buy a building, uh, you buy the building, $20 million, whatever it is. And and and, and, the, and the appraiser sends you an appraising report. And in some cases, certain portions of the building are separated. But in a cost segregation study, you would go unit by unit and take a look at how much the – because you still bought it for $20 million, right? But you still mm -hmm. figure out how much assets are in each uh, apartment. You know, we have a – uh, refrigerator, washer, dryer. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a, 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 maybe, maybe a, a, a unit in the pool, like a w water pump or whatever. We have all these things are loose assets that would, under normal circumstances, if you were to buy them brand new, they would be depreciated differently than just depreciating the building for 40 years or 39 years, right? So, um, so that being said, it, it, it could behoove you if you want a, a deeper deduction on the first year of purchase to instead of taking the entire building purchase minus the land and depreciating it over 39 years, you break down the entire purchase based on all the different assets inside that building. Go ahead, Heather. I just wanted that's to, a, that was my experience with it. No, that's exactly right. And and the last uh, cost segregation that, that, that I worked on was a dental practice and they bought a new building, refurbished it. And, you know, so we, we had lots of different components. The, you know, the construction company was working on the building itself. Um, they had some excavation work that had to be done. Um, they were building uh, desks, you know, built-in desks and other, um, you know, other, other fixtures inside the building that we really wanted to be aggressive on the depreciation of that building. So um, it was a lot of work and it takes a lot of planning. Um, you know, this this uh, this chart that I'm showing up here shows you how you can really maximize the deduction for a client, right? So we're looking at the cost before the segregation. The first year depreciation deduction would only be 128,000. 
after the cost segregation, we've actually broken those costs into the different class lives, um, we have a much, much larger deduction. So, um, and I actually borrowed this chart. You can see the URL there. I actually borrowed this chart from someone. I didn't do it myself. Just want to point that out. Um, but I really liked this this chart, and I thought it very it illustrated really well. Um, you know how you know how this is a huge benefit to clients, um, and if you, as a tax practitioner, um, decided this was something that you were really interested in pursuing, we're going to talk a little bit later on where you can find resources to do that. So I actually love how they even show you the net present value of the accelerated cash flow there, because that's really important too, right? So, all right, so let's go ahead and dive into approaches. So first of all, I want to say that um, the IRS does not have a set in stone set of standards for cost segregation engagements. So what they there is an organization out there that is, uh, you know, that that you can become part of to be a, a cost segregation specialist and you can be certified in that. But right now the IRS does not recognize a set of standards. So um, the different approaches that they do uh, reference in their documentation. And if you look at the URL here, this is from the cost segregation audit techniques. This is what they actually give to their auditors that are going out and auditing uh, cost segregation. So I'm going to just briefly go through these different methods. Um, the first one is the detailed engineering approach from actual cost records. And this is the most comprehensive. So what this does is you use the cost information to accurately allocate costs to the classification groups. And it's the most methodical and accurate approach. So what you're doing here is you're taking all the actual cost records and you're allocating them to the particular assets. So you're identifying, you know, we bought five refrigerators. You're identifying um, this amount of number was being used um, to build uh, workstations or, or, you know, you get the idea. Um, and you're actually, taking the actual receipts and you're mapping that, you're basically mapping that to the uh, to the assets. Then once you've identified all of those costs, then at that point you would take any combined costs, um, you know, general contractors fees, other expenses, and then you would allocate them based on a pro rata rate. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. The detailed engineering cost estimate is similar to the detailed engineering approach from actual cost method, but it uses estimates instead of actual costs. So you're reconciling those estimates from the contractors to actual costs that were incurred. And this might come into play if you don't have access to all the actual receipts, you just know what the total amount was paid. So what you would do is you would get cost estimates from each of the contractors and subcontractors and use those estimates to allocate the cost to the assets. Um, the survey or uh, letter approach is very similar as well. In this case, what's happening is you have the, uh, the same steps from a detailed engineering approach, um, which we're going to go over in just a minute. Um, but the contractors and subcontractors complete a survey to provide info on the cost of the specific assets. And then you would take that information and you'd use that to allocate the total cost of the project. Okay, the residual estimation approach is where you identify the short term assets only. So this is where you're just going through and you're fi finding the five or seven year property. You're identifying that and then you subtract it from the total and all of the residual costs would be treated as the long lived asset like a building. Um, and then we have the sampling or moder uh, modeling approach, which is where you compare the project to a sample of other projects that are similar. So you look at another project and you see that, you know, 10% is five-year property, 20% is seven-year property, and um, the rest is 39-year property. And then you use the sampling of other projects and you, you, uh, you use that to allocate on the project that you're, you're segregating. Um, and then the final one, and this is the rule of thumb, and this is based on the practitioner's experience in a particular industry, and they'll allocate based on their industry averages or their experience in that particular um, industry. And this one, this holds the least amount of weight, obviously, under an audit according to the IRS, right? Because this is based on somebody's own interpretation of their experience and their expertise. So that's, pro you know, that's going to be more scrutinized. And obviously, the one that's um, the most ironclad would be the detailed engineering approach from actual costs, because there, what we're doing is we're taking all the costs and then we're reconciling it to the total project cost. So we're taking all the pieces that are going to the, the individual class lives and we're reconciling the receipts and everything else to the total project cost. So those are the different methods. 
um, the steps to performing a cost segregation study, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the detailed engineering approach from actual cost, but these steps actually, uh, you know, are used in almost all of the methods. Um, probably the last three, you wouldn't you wouldn't go into, um, you know, the on-site visits uh, because you'd just be using an overall percentage. So the first thing is to identify the specific project and analyze the, you know, to analyze the assets. And here's where I think that planning is really crucial. So if you have a client and you know that they're contemplating a project or, or an acquisition, um, it's really important to talk to them upfront about how they're going to keep track. How are they going to account for the costs and make sure that you have a system in place for them to collect documents. Now for bigger companies, usually they already have this, they have the infrastructure to be able to account for costs and stay organized. But for you know a smaller client, they may need help and direction from you um, to tell them, hey, you know, this is how I want you to keep track of all the records for each part of a project or for the whole project. That will make your life much, much easier in the, in, in the later steps of, of the engagement. So have that conversation early. It's important to identify when your client needs um, a cost segregation study. So um, the next step is to collect the information on all the direct and indirect costs. And you wanna substantiate and reconcile the study to the total project cost. So if you know that your client paid $5 million for the total project and you have $3.5 you know, $3 million in receipts, you still have some work to do, right? Because you, if it's total five million, you want to have five million of documentation that you'll be able to use during that, uh, during the rest of the engagement. The next step is to conduct an on-site visit, and you want to determine the nature and the use, and physically identify the specific assets in the study. So you're going to actually go out to, you know, to the location, and you're going to look at what's there. You're going to look at the actual assets. If there's a refrigerator, you're going to make a notation of it, and you know, it's really helpful to take a photograph. So take a picture of it. So when you go back and you're actually doing the allocation, you have a visual reference of what you saw during that site visit. You also want to request any before photos. So if it's a refurbish, that's really helpful because you'll be able to see what the property was like before the refurbish and what it's like afterwards. And that will help you to determine um, what, what the cost, you know, how it should be allocated. Um, you also want to review documentation from architects, builders, or, or you know anyone else that worked on the project that's going to give you insight into the how it should be allocated. So, for example, if they hired a contractor, say your client hired a contractor and they did, you know, they worked on the building, but then they also did some excavation in the parking lot. Um, maybe they build with one invoice, right? Maybe they paid, you know, forty thousand dollars for the whole job. But in the documentation from that contractor, it says, hey, you know, it breaks it down in the estimate what goes to which asset. And that's going to help you to determine the percentages and the allocation of the cost to the individual assets. So that's really, I mean, the, the, the you know, conducting the on-site visit and the review, that really is the bulk of the engagement. That's where most of the time is spent, is analyzing that data, organizing it. And then at that point, you assign the specific assets. Um, in the document review and you assign them to the appropriate classes. Um, once you've assigned the cost to the specific classes, so five year property, seven year property, 15, 39, um, you get the idea. Then at that point, you're gonna find that there's some indirect costs. Um, this could be uh, utility uh, utility payments before the asset was, was uh, actually put in service. Um, it could be um, rental fees you know, insurance, things like that. And those are actually gonna be allocated to the individual assets based on a pro rata uh, basis. So you would take the total, you know, if, there, if it was 10% five, um, five year assets, you know, 15% seven year assets, you're gonna take those indirect costs and allocate them to the assets that way. And then um, you're gonna group the assets with the similar class lives, recovery periods, et cetera. Um, and that's how you're going to simplify the, depreci simplify the depreciation computations. So you're going to take all the five-year assets, and then you're going to make the depreciation calculation based on, um, you know, based on on um, which convention you're going to be using, and the different methods that you're going to be depreciating the assets. So that's that's really the process of performing a cost segregation study. 
All right, um, professional designation. So this is for the tax preparers that are saying, hey, you know, this sounds like something I really want to offer to my clients. Um, there is the American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals. It's a relatively new, I say relatively new, it's been around for 11 years, um, that was established to develop technical standards and provide a code of ethics for professionals that were offering the service. Okay, so they stepped in to, you know, become basically an authority on cost segregation studies and provide training and certification to their members. So there's different membership levels based on experience and passing exams. Each membership level there is an exam for, and that's how you move to the next level. A certified cost segregation professional, which is the highest level, the requirements for this are really rigorous. They, it actually requires an exam, but you also have to have a minimum of seven years experience doing cost segregation work, a recommendation by two members of the, you know, certified members of the organization, and an interview in addition to passing that exam. And I included the URL on this slide, so if you wanna go check it out and kind of, this is also a great place for taxpayers. If you think that this is a service that you need, they actually have a searchable database of their members, so you could actually find uh, a certified cost segregation professional at this site as well. Um, so uh, that that's it for my slideshow. Um, do you have any, I guess, Hector, we don't have a whole lot of time. It looks like we have about two minutes left. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to take some questions or what you'd like to do. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you must have your mute. Yeah. There you go. So one of the questions here is um, the you know, can anyone do it? Do you have to guess do you have to be certified to do it? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I assume that if the state doesn't require someone to do that then you, you, you shouldn't have to be certified, I would guess. But but uh, in my opinion, if, if you're doing a big purchase and doing a big cost segregation study that's going to reduce your taxable, uh, you know, liability by half a million dollars, you know, I think it would be a much credible uh, you know, situation if you do it by a certified individual. What's your take on that? No, I agree. I don't think that there is, like I said, um, the IRS itself doesn't recognize any... Um, you know, any authoritative or authoritative body, but I agree with you on that. Uh, if it were me and I was looking for a, a cost segregation study, I would definitely look for a firm that was certified and that was, you know, adhered to uh, a code of ethics. And that's something, um, you know, that that association offers. So, sure. Uh, definitely another agree with you another on question that. I see here, and I may be able to answer it, but I'll ask you. Anyway, uh, all depreciation is done at historical cost. So, so how much you paid mm -hmm. for the asset. Are there situations where you can reevaluate the value of the assets and um, you know, maybe through a cost segregation study for a, a, a property that you already have and then so you can take a deeper depreciation? Is, it, is there such a thing? You know, I'm not sure. I, that's not something that we ever, that's not part of the services that we ever provided. Um, I do know that, uh, you know, that there's, I, I, the, thing that come, jumps to my mind on this is an appraisal, right? We're talking about an appraisal, right. yeah, um, yes. which is a little bit different. I mean, and there are certified appraisal uh, professionals out there that you can hire to do that. I think this is different because really we're doing a cost segregation study based on the actual costs that of were new, incurred. Of a new acquisition too. Exactly. Because right. it, it, what, 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 what wouldn't make sense is that you, that you reevaluate your assets, take a capital gain, <laughs> right, right, uh, right, and then take a deeper depreciation. That wouldn't make any sense, right? So then, nope. th this is only for newly purchased assets. Uh, there's no more questions, well, Heather. But uh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, you know, if you, you know, if I had existing an existing building and I did a refurbish, and I may still want to do a cost segregation study on that refurbish, um, so that I'm making sure that I'm I'm uh, identifying you know, assets that were part of that, that have a shorter life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you- So if at least hold improvement, I would, do, you know, a cost segregation study might be applicable to that because so you, if they because, put in- But you have life, to be making a new expenditure to it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yes, absolutely. All right. All right. Perfect. Let me run the last polling question here, uh, which is, you know, did you learn something new? And this, this kind of lets us know, uh, you know, what, you know, how, how we should put these things together. Uh, you know whether we are, let's say, let's call it advanced enough for the for the for the people attending. Um, you know, so if enough people say no, I already knew this content, 
then I, you know, I have to be more careful about doing content that, uh, that most people know. But I think for the most part, I think, um, I think most people are answering, yeah, some of it was new or, uh, but I was so familiar with some of it. And it, that's kind of like, that, that's the mixture of answers we get. If, if, if a larger portion of the attendees are accounting professionals, they're at some point, they're, I mean, they're, they're familiar with, with, with most of it, but the, the idea is that we at least, you know, give you something new or some, something to start uh, researching upon. Uh, somebody else says uh, that you said, uh, referring to me, that you said that uh, organizational costs and startup costs are amortizable in five years. I did make a mistake. The answer is 15 years. So organizational and um, startup costs is 15 year, not five year. Um, okay, let me go ahead and close the polling question. And uh, Heather, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. Uh, I loved uh, that, that you came in and you talked about a very cool topic. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, the next episode will be in a month uh, on June 7th, and we'll talk about shareholder distributions, corporate dividends, guarantee payments, and officer compensation, another area of a lot of questions I get from my from my tax clients. Then in July, we're going to be doing uh, deferred compensation, like retirement plans, 401ks, IRAs, things like that. And then in August, we'll do international taxation. I was going to do international taxation next month, but I need more time to prepare because that was actually a pretty uh, deep, heavy topic. Now, other webinars uh, that I'm involved with, there will be another webinar in one hour. So I'll get one hour break for lunch in one hour at 2 p.m. Eastern called Excel Power Hour. And I have a guest speaker that will talk about time-saving shortcuts and uh, text functions to clean up data. If you're an Excel person, you would definitely like this episode. Then uh, next, not tomorrow, but next Thursday, there will be a QB Power Hour, which is a webinar series for QuickBooks Power users. And the topic on this one, actually, the topic is wrong on this one. It's practice management. So um, sorry about that. So practice management. I will be talking about practice management for QuickBooks professionals. Then on the 17th uh, of, um, of May at 12 p.m. Eastern, we'll be having a enterprise expert webinar series. That webinar series has, has already been uh, functional for about a year, but we do advanced QuickBooks and enterprise uh, tips and tricks. And then the same day, Wednesday the 17th at 4 p.m., we'll be doing a deep dive into social media platforms in small business power hours. So there's a lot of webinars uh, in May. Uh, and for now, they're still all free and you can sign up by going into those websites. Anyway, uh, stay connected. Uh, email me or email Heather if you have uh, any questions. Absolutely. There's Heather. There's Heather's website. Her email is qbotrainer at gmail.com. Uh, join the Facebook group uh, to have more discussions about this topic or other tax topics. And uh, check out the website regularly as we'll be doing some updates. Heather, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. And for the ones that are logging in uh, to Excel Power Hour, I see you in an hour. Thank you very much.